All right, well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the March, can you believe it, March SP webinar call. Um, we uh, will not have Rachel joining us tonight, uh, so Chip and I are going to uh, um, run the webinar with a special guest speaker. I wanted to mention the homework assignment for tonight's uh, webinar just so you can be thinking about this as you're listening and we will record the webinar and make that available to you um, like usual uh, but we're asking that you write a one-page uh, essay about tonight's talk and try and find three points that um, discussion points that that you learned uh, in Dustin's talk tonight so uh, that would be due a week from today and uh, again you can submit it to the SPC email and and we'll get back to you on on those chip anything else to add as far as announcements for SPC um, I, I would let you know that um, your weights and average daily gains have been updated uh, through February so if you hadn't had a chance to to go to juniorsimmental.org and take a gander, you can see that those are in there. Um, and again, I think what most of us would say, the the weather everywhere has been a, a little bit brutal. Um, but I can tell you the average weight of those calves at present is 1145. Well, I say at present, I think it was maybe of three or four days ago, uh, it was 1145. The average, average daily gain from the start from early November um, is holding in at 4.44. So Dustin, that tells you a little bit about how the calves have gained since they came to us in early November. Um, so Dustin knows, because he probably hasn't heard this, they came in average in 640 and, and, and now we're just a shade over 1145, I would guess. So almost average in four and a half. And so you can go back and, and, and look at your specific calf if you would like. So um, and, and as always, if you have questions, you know how to by now to, to put those in um, and we'll convey those to our speaker a little bit later um, or as we go along if need be. So I won't take too much time, but you can see on the screen, I hope that the goal here is talking about just everything to do with kind of a big 30,000 foot view of marketing that feedlot cat. And you all are getting pretty close to that time. We are, you here at 1145, we're eking reasonably close to some of these calves starting to thinking about heading to a packing plant in not too many weeks. And so I thought it pertinent to have somebody who understands that space well, and also has an ability to convey it in a way that common mortals like myself can swallow it. So I'll let um, our speaker tell you a little bit more about what he does, but I'm gonna tell you why we have him on here. Um, I've had the privilege to, to get to meet and know Dustin Perman um, just over really the last number of months. First time we met was last summer. Um, I was terribly impressed with his ability to, uh, to interact with a wide variety of cattle, cattle women. And going forward, um, I was fortunate enough to have him join me, given a, a joint talk at a, at a cattleman's meeting in southwest Missouri some many months back. And again, was very well received, and I, I thought was just a perfect fit to help us in our conversation to get a bit better handle on what your calves are going through, um, what some of what they've gone through, and then, of course, what they're looking forward to over the next little bit. So, Dustin Perman from Northwest Iowa, I'll let, he, let him tell you a little more. Dustin, I'll be quiet. The floor is yours. Thank you, Chip. I really appreciate the opportunity to be with you guys tonight. Um, just a little bit about a background of myself as I grew up on a small row crop cow calf uh, with a few swine uh, operation in, in northwest Iowa and uh, after uh, getting into the limousine business and, and selling seed stock as, as through the years when I grew up and, and showing and selling I uh, took off and went to South Dakota State uh, for, for a number of years and then got a degree there and also uh, found uh, a wife that uh, puts up with me today after uh, 16 years. So that's that's a really good treat at this point in life with a couple of kids. And we uh, run a few cows at our house uh, today. And we even have a Simital Angus Cross uh, heifer out in the pen that'll come with our second calf here in, a, in probably 60 days or so. So we're excited about the arrival of the new calves coming. And uh, 
Currently, I work for a local uh, cooperative as a feed uh, nutrition and consultant. So about 90% of my time is spent with farmer feeders around Northwest Iowa, Southwest Minnesota, uh, working through uh, helping them uh, with everything that has to do with feedlot business from buying calves to get recommendations on how to get them sold and then where to sell them to. And about 10% uh, of my time is spent with cow-calf operations and, and helping those folks with nutrition and management decisions on, on getting those uh, cows to be the most profitable they can be around our area. So, um, like I said, excited to be here. And uh, hopefully I hit the mark here with uh, what Chip is looking for and you guys are looking for. So we'll kind of get into the slide set and, and we'll go for it. Uh, if there are any questions, don't be afraid to uh, to let me know as we go and we'll try and cover things as we go. Otherwise, uh, I know how it is. You, you get on down the road and you forget something and, and you really wish to ask it. So uh, please feel free to get those questions out and, and we'll get started here. So. So when I think about uh, helping my guys in the feedlot and, and we're looking at buying a pen of calves, uh, what is the target? We need to identify that target. And, and for most of my guys, the thing that they think about most is what kind of cattle can I buy today to make me the most amount of money? We need to remember that we're in this as a, as a profit center and a for-profit business. This cattle feeding business is not really a hobby. Um, if it was, it would uh, probably be a lot tougher to get into, but uh, we have folks that uh, work in this and, and want to make a living at it. So we need to make sure that we pay attention to all the factors that are going to influence the profitability of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. So as we think about identifying the target, we need to develop a plan to reach the target. So there are a lot of things that come into effect when we start looking at reaching the target. Cattle would be a prime example. Are we gonna feed steers, heifers, cull cows, cull bulls? All of those types of animals have a, an endpoint in the marketplace that, that can be profitable at different times of the year. And what are we gonna do when we go to the market to purchase cattle to make sure that we find the ones that are gonna be profitable for us going down the road? Other things that play into it, housing and water. What kind of pen space or building do we have to put the cattle in? Do we have plenty of water? Do we have all the natural resources that we need around to make sure that we can take care of the cattle? Which turns into feeds and feeding. Do you have enough feed put up? In my area, we grow a lot of corn and soybeans, not very much alfalfa. So, a lot of guys are chopping silage or they're grinding high moisture ear corn in the fall to put up and have an ensiled feed to go into the rations to help grow the cattle while they're on feed. After that, we think about feed additives and different things that we can put in the feed to help us keep the cattle healthy and growing as efficiently as possible. Another thing that we need to be aware of is animal health. It seems to me that a lot of those calves out west on grass don't ever have a bad day in their life in the pictures. But believe you me, when they come to the feedlot, the stress level increases, the disease load increases, and cattle can get sick. So we need to be proactive in making sure that we're getting those cattle vaccinated when they come into the feed yard. Implants are another very important financial impact in the life of those calves. Getting the cattle implanted can pay back 20 to 30 times the cost of the implant, depending on how long you get, you let that implant run. With all those things in mind, we need to make sure we're tracking the cattle. We want to do make sure that our record keeping is up to date to, so we know what's going on, so we can make decisions on the fly. And finally, we need to have a marketing plan for those cattle. Where are we going to go with them? What are we going to do with them? Are we going to sell them in the meat? Are we going to sell them live? Are we going to put them into a grid program? Do we have a specialty program that they would like to go that we think that we could make some money with as far as a non-hormone treated or a never ever anything plan? There's lots of different programs and lots of different protocols that cattle can be put into nowadays. 
So we'll break each of these down a little further. So as we talk about, what are you looking for? Are they red steers? Are they black steers? Are they steer? Are they heifers that are going to fit into a certain protocol? I heard the other day that there was a white base, twenty-five dollar premium for a white base. All those things play a role into the, the profit that we're looking and profit potential they may bring. We want to make for sure that they've had a good, healthy start from wherever they came from. There's no sense bringing in sick cattle to the feedlot and giving ourselves any more problems than what we've already got. We sure don't want the calves to be carrying much flesh, so we want them to be pretty thin hided so that we can put the weight on here at the feedlot versus letting somebody else get paid to put those pounds on somewhere else. When we're talking about calves and we evaluate those calves coming through the sale barn, we want to make sure they've got small heads. We don't want those big long heads. It seems to me when calves get a big long head on them, all of a sudden their, their body weight might not match their age. And who knows where they came from at that point. Another long tail are long tails. Tails that are extra long are a sign that the calves are a lot older than what they might be or may be for size. A particular breed may also offer you a premium at the end depending on what your marketing plan is. Do they need to be Angus? Do they need to be Semitol? Do they need to be a Red Angus or Hereford? All those programs have premiums. There are a lot of tools out there to help us find the correct animals. We can use reputable order buyers that we've heard have a good track record or we know that have had a good track record. We've got tools like the Feeder Cattle Value Index that's out there that can help set those cattle against everybody else so we know what they should bring in the market. Or trusted advisors that work in the cattle business can also help the feedlots by helping them run a cost projection prior to purchase so they can have a good idea what they can afford to pay when they go to the sale barn or when they go to negotiate a deal in the country to buy the calves. Housing gets to be a pretty critical thing especially when we get up into the upper midwest where I live and further north up towards the Canadian border. As most of you know the winter has been pretty harsh and the snow has been just unforgiving with over 40 barns going down just last week in Minnesota. It makes you think about where you're gonna put those cattle. So for most of the guys around here in Northwest Iowa and Southwest Minnesota, open dirt yards are very common. A lot of them have mounds and some of them have windbreaks, which all add uh, protection and a place for the cattle to get out of the mud and away from the wind. Another style of open yard would be the Iowa style, as Dr. Pritchard and, Brook and Brookings would call them, and that's a covered bunk where you would drive your tractor and feed wagon past a, a, a bunk feeding the cattle while they ate underneath the bunk and then would go out into the yard and lay down. We also have deep bedded barns across this part of the world. They offer a lot of shade in the summer and protection from the wind in the, in the winter. They do create a lot of work getting all the cattle bedded and cleaned on a regular basis, but they do help protect from the elements. Slat barns are another option. Slat barns have become wildly popular in the last five years in this area where we have cattle that can go on the slats and they don't take any additional bedding. Manure is contained in one place and can be spread onto the field and we can gain all the nutrients that we would otherwise lose in a dry manure situation. Or if you're into the grass and natural feeding, grass paddocks can be a place where you're going to feed cattle, but not around here. Keeping pens clean and dry will ensure cattle will gain the most efficiently. Cattle that get dirty and carry tag or manure on their sides take more energy, especially in the winter, to keep warm. When cattle start using energy just to keep warm, it takes away from the energy they can use to grow. Mud and pen, mud is also a big problem in pens. You know yourself that when you walk with your boots on up to your knees across the muddy pen to go get the cows across, how much more energy it takes to do that. It's the same with your feedlot cattle. 
they're burning more energy just to get across the pen. So the more, the deeper the mud, the more energy it takes. Water is one of the keys to health and performance in the feedlot. Water from wells needs to be checked for, for suitability for livestock. You sure don't want to get into a situation where it's high in sulfur or magnesium or total, total dissolved solids to where the cattle won't want to drink it or it could cause health issues. We want to make sure that all cattle have adequate space to get to a water. And we want to make sure once they get to the water that there's plenty of water in there that they can get a good drink when they go up there. We want to make sure the waters get cleaned out on a regular basis so that they don't end up have things growing in them. You've all seen waters that got feed in the bottom and junk growing. And when you get them cleaned out, your hands stink. If we can, you really wouldn't want to drink water coming out of that fountain, would you? Neither do they. So the better job we can do keeping our fountains clean, the more water they drink and the more feed they eat. So just for a rule of thumb that we use, I like to advise people to use one cubic foot of water space for each 25 head, or at least one square inch of surface space per head at your waterer. Extreme heat and cold can definitely drive the different water intake and has a chance of decreasing feed intake, therefore also decreasing gain. When we talk about feeds and feedings, we have conventional programs and we have all kinds of specialty programs and protocols that are out there. So once we figure out what direction we're gonna go, we need to create a ration plan, identify feeds that can be fed at a cost-effective price. Like I referenced earlier, high moisture ear corn and corn silage become very effective feeds at a price point in Northwest Iowa with our abundance of corn around here that we grow. The other thing we need to take a look at is once we have the diets formulated is how many days should they be on each ration? How long do those calves need to grow before they get transitioned up to a higher energy density diet till they get to the end of their growing period? The more fiber or the less energy that we feed on the front end can help grow frames on cattle. The higher energy and the more starch that we feed usually will help cattle fatten faster and more efficiently. Feeds need to be stored so that they stay in their best condition possible. We want to limit waste and spoilage to keep our dollars in our own pocket. It's also very important to deliver the right amount of a mixed ration on a daily basis. Cattle are big walking fermenters. And if we don't continue to feed those cattle at the same time every day, all of a sudden the bugs in the fermenter get confused about what they need to be doing. So if we want the bugs in the rumen to continue to work efficiently, we need to feed it the same every day. Research would show that cattle that are fed within 15 minutes can tell a difference from cattle that are fed at a wider time gap. The animal health side is also very important. Cattle need to be vaccinated upon arrival to help keep them healthy at the feedlot. <clears throat> Disease, pressure, and stress are tremendously different from where they came from. Working with a local veterinarian to help you set up your own protocol is probably your best option to make sure that the calves stay healthy while they live at your feed yard. Sick cattle cost their owners a lot of money from lost performance to affecting other cattle or even dying. I know the Texas Tech or the, the Ranch to Rail data talked about how much money that was. And the first treatment's about $85 or $90, and then it goes up to $165 after that, just for being sick. It's not very profitable when we have to spend that much on lost performance or medicine. It's also good practice to treat incoming cattle with an insecticide to kill internal and external parasites that can prevent cattle from gaining weight easily. We want to give the cattle every chance they have, they can, we can, to help them grow fast and efficiently. 
for cattle that are fed conventionally, we have the opportunity to use ionophores. Ionophores help convert feed into gain more efficiently. They can also help with coccidiosis control or even appetite suppression. The three most common ionophores used in the feedlots today are rumensin, Bovitec, and Catalyst. Beta agonists are also helpful in putting more weight on the cattle very efficiently. Optiflux is currently the only beta agonist on the market and is labeled to be fed from 28 to 42 days to add more lean muscle to the carcass. If I remember right, heifers put on about 12 pounds and steers put on about 17 pounds of carcass weight after being fed Optiflex for 28 to 42 days. Intake modifier technology is also something that's in the market. And for folks that wanna feed cattle on a self feeder, Intake modifiers can be help can help with feed efficiency and avoid acidosis and high energy rations coming through a self feeder. Implants are one of the few things that we can prove work every time. Implanting cattle makes them grow a lot more efficiently. It's important with all the different products that are out there for implants that we match the correct implant with the correct animal and the correct days on feed to ensure the most success for the cattle and the producer that are using the implant. Harvesting cattle before implants have had enough time to work can cause poor grading conditions. A lot of the feedlot implants are supposed to be used from 90 to 120 days. If those cattle get implanted and are on feed for less than 60 days after that, we can see dramatic decreases in grade because the cattle haven't had enough time to work through all the implant. And if you're selling on the grid, that can be a very negative uh, outcome if you're getting paid for the number of choice or prime cattle that you're selling. Evaluating cattle prior to harvest. I think it's important to remember that when cattle are fat, their overall look is very smooth. There's no ripples. When we, when we think about the bodybuilders, look how many ripples and bumps and stuff there are in their bodies. But when we look at the fat cattle, you can just put your hand over it and run it right down their side because they're very smooth. Fat deposition on either side of the tail head is another tall tail sign of a calf that's getting to his end point. Another area to evaluate is the brisket area. The brisket area typically fills up with fat when cattle get to their end point. Fat thickness over the loin at, at least three tenths of an inch is typically when a calf will grade choice. So if we're gonna be selling those cattle into a grid or into a value system, we need to make sure that we have at least three tenths of an inch of fat to ensure that those cattle have a chance to grade choice. If we're looking for a bigger premium, we may even wanna push that to eight tenths of an inch to make sure that we're getting all the good out of the cattle that we can and giving every steer a chance to grade. Another tall tail sign that cattle are getting done on feed is they start to eat less. As, we're, as we track feed intakes and we watch those cattle continually decline every day, if they start to decline continually for two or three weeks, it's all of a sudden we need to get those cattle on the show list and get them shown to the packer if they haven't been already. It takes practice. And it helps if you have an, ex an experienced evaluator that can help show you what to look for. And my guess is there'd be folks in your area that would help you do that if you reached out to them. Tracking or record keeping is another very important part of the feedlot business. It's important to know how your cattle are eating, growing, and what the projected break even is while the cattle are still on feed. If we don't know that, we may end up selling the cattle too soon or at a loss if we should have maybe fed the cattle longer to a larger end weight. Tracking cattle feed intake can also help show when the cattle are finished. Cattle that are finished decrease how much they eat each day. 
having the having a record of how a group of cattle performed can be a very important aid in decision making when it comes time to filling the pen again and whether or not you want to buy those same cattle back. It's good to know the cattle you do want back and the ones you don't want back. Marketing time. When we're getting real close, kind of like you guys are getting with the cattle you have on feed now. Are the cattle fat enough to be harvested? Sometimes the cattle come into the market response and the cattle may not quite be done, but we might not be able to feed them long enough because what we know the market might do upcoming. So we market the cattle a little earlier than we normally would otherwise. Have they had enough days on feed since the last implant? We want to make sure that we get the right number of days on feed, especially if we're selling into a value program. Are the cattle protected on the Chicago, Chicago Mercantile Exchange with a live cattle contract or an option? If they are, basis can become a major issue, whether it's positive or negative and how that affects your profit. So sometimes we have to wait to sell the cattle until the basis comes together, even though maybe the cattle are telling us that they're done in the feed yard or they're showing us by visual appraisal that they're already done. Cattle performance does decline as they get bigger, <clears throat> but sometimes depending on what the market is doing or what it has done seasonally in the past may allow us to continue to feed them to catch a better market. Those are all things that we'll have, you have to know by looking at past history and what the, what the trend of the market is on an annual basis. That's the little bit that I prepared for you tonight. If you guys have questions, I'd be more than happy to answer anything you guys have. Dustin, thank you. Um, so youngsters, if you have questions, again, throw those in. I have a handful to throw at you. Do you mind, Dustin? No, absolutely. First of all, I, I'm guessing the, the bulk of our uh, young folks. We do have a few that might be in regions where they would have seen a slat barn. But I'm guessing mm -hmm. most are not familiar with that. They might understand the parallel maybe in a different species a little bit. Could you describe what a slat barn is? Uh, primarily a slat barn in our part of the world would uh, would be very similar to, to like a, a swine feeding facility where you would have uh, concrete slats that are over top of a, a deep pit that catches the manure. As it, as it, you know, as the manure goes down through the slats, and then uh, there would be two different styles. There would be either a gable roof style uh, that would be open uh, on both sides with a curtain. Typically, uh, the buildings would run from east to west, and there would be a curtain on the north side to control the wind in, in and around that building. Um, there would also be a monoslope where you would have a single pitch that would run uh, uphill from north to south. Uh, so when the sun in the, in the winter is at its lowest point that we still get sun all the way to the north side of the pen, uh, a lot of those buildings would have uh, uh, J bunks, feed bunks or fence line bunks on each side of the pen and we would feed uh, both on the north and the south side, uh, typically with waters along the walls or along the gates uh, on the divider pens. So those, those cattle would be uh, would primarily get about 20 to 22 square feet per head. So it's pretty tight confines typically, but uh, they're becoming very popular uh, with the amount of labor that they take in this part of the world. So uh, uh, another question, one from one of our uh, SBC participants, Ms. Audrey asked, um, you, well, let's set it up. You mentioned that there are different times of the year when prices are, are traditionally a little bit better. So Audrey's question is, when in the year is the highest price typically received for fat cattle? Uh, I would say typically uh, late winter, early spring would be seasonally the, the, the highest price. Uh, typically the highest price on the mercantile exchange or on the CME is typically the April live cattle contract or the February uh, live cattle contract would typically be the highest prices on a, on a year in year out basis. Very good. And, and, to some extent, so that the folks on here have some appreciation, those are times when it's frequently fairly difficult to, to get fat cattle, right? Sometimes it's a little harder to get cattle then, so it drives the price. Would that be accurate? It is, because the majority of, of cows get calved in the spring, and those calves hit the markets, as most of you know, in the fall. 
And when those cattle go on feed sometime between uh, September 1 and, and January 1, uh, a lot of those cattle get finished out somewhere between June and September. So the lion share of uh, cattle hit the market in, in, in the summer. And, and typically we see a depressed market just because of supply that time of year. Uh, those calves uh, go to town and, and, and most of our guys will put yearling cattle type back in that have come off grass or, or something to that effect. And uh, they'll be weighing in the nine, 800 to 1,000, 1,100 pound range. And the challenge is, as we get to, to February and March and, and in the first part of April, and if depending on the feeding season, all those cattle aren't ready yet. And, and we have just a little bit of a shortage that typically drives up price. And seasonally, we just don't, for the most part, have as many cattle at a market ready weight at that time. So I think that's the majority of, of where we get that push in the fed cattle market at. Dustin, another question. You used a terminology that uh, is, is heavy in the feedlot and packing sector um, and maybe less familiar to those of us in other parts. Use the term tag. What is that? Uh, it's, a, it's an interesting uh, explanation. It, uh, uh, for lack of better terms, it's probably a combination of manure, bedding, and dirt. It's, it's that... Uh, it's all that stuff that hangs in the hair that's not hair. It's when they lay on the bedding pile and they stand up and they got manure and dirt or mud or, or whatever it is. And that stuff just kind of, it, it, uh, it adheres to that hair. And boy, if you've ever had a club calf or a 4-H calf that's uh, had that in it, it's tough to wash out. And, and honestly, it weighs a lot. And in talking with some of the packers, they tell me that it's fairly common for cattle to carry 100 to 200 pounds of tag with them out of the feed yards and into the packing plants when they leave. So when that happens, the packers want to discount you for that weight. And they typically will force you to sell them the cattle in the beef versus on a live basis because they don't want to pay for that tag or that mud that they're carrying along with them out of the feed yard. And, and I would guess different regions of the country probably are, are prone to, the bigger challenges, right? I mean, a, a good portion of our cattle tend to be fed in the in the High Plains region where there's not quite as much rain. Um, mm -hmm. it's, whereas, it's probably more of an issue. Maybe where, where you're at rain. a little different. It is, you know, we, we're probably uh, somewhere in the 30 inch rain, annual rainfall here. You know, when you start getting into the seven to nine inch rainfall, annual rainfall, some of those things go away. And, and honestly, I think that's probably why some of the appeal uh, to feeding cattle in the south and into the more arid climates is, is has some appeal because they don't fight with mud like we do here. And I'm afraid that if we didn't have to deal with mud, we could really give them a lesson on feeding cattle up here. But that's kind of our crutch in life is we have to deal with mud. And, and because of that, we've got buildings now. So Another term that you mentioned, you should know because of the unique nature of this sort of group, um, it's not terribly conducive to put to do a lot of hedging and, and protect risk management on, on these pins. It's a little more challenging. So yeah. they're not as directly familiar with those. W would you explain what basis is and sort of um, make it really simple so I can understand it? You know me, so you know this. You're going to have to be really careful. So... So what happens uh, when you manage your risk with the with the mercantile exchange is, is that you um, you purchase a, a price on the board of trade you, per, you you hedge that number on there and and when it comes time to sell the cattle you're going to sell the cattle in the cash market and your cash price is more than likely going to be different than the price that you have protected on the board of trade. So the difference between the board of trade price and your cash price is called basis. And sometimes basis can be positive or sometimes it can be negative depending on if your cash price is above or below what your protected price is on the board of trade. Well done. Um, actually, that's one of the simpler, more straightforward explanations of basis I've ever heard. Um, I'm going to ask you to speculate a second. Okay. 
And, and, and so to be clear, I, to the, to the folks listening, I, I don't necessarily know if there's a right answer to what I'm about to ask, but one thing that uh, some of you may have noticed is that the spreads between um, choice and select have started to come down at certain times as some of the packers have started to get a fairly solid population of choice cattle. Um, not always the case, but there's some of that happening. The question to you, Dustin, is you talked about, you know, we're feeding cattle up towards, you know, eight tenths of an inch and the like. Do you see any opportunity in the near future? And this is particular interest to a group that has a lot of continental influence where packers put a little bit more pressure on yield grade from a dollar standpoint. I hope so. Um, uh, one of my friends from, Dakota, from your standpoint, why would you, so the, those of us listening, tell me why you would hope that. So one of my friends from South Dakota state it worked for a packer and he and I had a, a nice visit this morning and, and it somewhat, uh, addresses this a little bit, I guess. And, and, and my issue or his issue as a buyer for, for the pack that he works for is that we've got cattle that are continually getting to be huge. And, and we were talking about a particular client of mine that sold some cattle that weighed 1700 pounds. And the producer said, boy, those cattle need another month on feed. And I said, how are you going to sell an 1825 pound steer? And we talked about the challenges that we have with those steers going in 1700 and not being fat yet. And he said to me, he said, Dustin, actually, it costs us more to cut fat off of the carcass than to trim large carcasses correct to spec for USDA. So I don't know if I, as, as somebody that would, that would kind of be in the same boat you guys are in as far as my preference for cattle, I want that yield or that, uh, that yield grade premium to be there. I just don't know that the packers are going to see enough value to reward us for that at this point. Um, well, I, I think it's a crystal ball question. So I, I, I appreciate you kind of going through that. It's something that I, I, I think, Packers themselves are struggling with right now, uh, and mm -hmm. deciding if and when they might do that. So, um, appreciate that that thought process. I have another question for you. Um, so, you, you mentioned the Mercantile, uh, Chicago Mercantile Exchange. Um, so, if the price uh, again, this one comes from uh, one of our members from Northern Missouri. Ms. Lindsay mm -hmm. asked, um, if the price that you purchased on the Merc is lower than the cash price, can you still sell at the higher price? So the way the Board of Trade works is that for every buyer of a contract, there's a seller of a contract. So ultimately, uh, what's going on is when, when, let's say that I've got a group of cattle that I need to protect. So I'm gonna, I have to go to my local uh, brokerage firm, you know, that's close to me and and i go there and they have the ability to trade a contract for me so they set up my account and when depending on if i buy the cattle or sell the contract if i buy the cattle or if i buy the contract and the market goes against me the person that owns the other side of the contract is kicking in the money into my account to make me whole because my price stays where it is so I can have my hedge account could have money in it because the market goes against me or the, just the opposite. If it goes the other way, then I got to make up the difference to keep my contract whole. So there's margin money in your account. That's making that that's making everything get back to zero on your hedge account. So there's, there's the rub of risk management, right? Yep. Yep. You're protecting a price. You're not, it, but the other side of risk management is you have options. There are options that you can also purchase puts and calls uh, that give you some other options on managing risk and how that works. And, and those are more a function of time value and intrinsic value 
that you can purchase and you can protect a price with no risk or with no margin calls. So that, that's a whole nother story and that could honestly be a whole nother webinar for you guys if you really wanted to get into it. Yeah, that risk management conversation gets to be a, a pretty deep one and people spend years and years getting serious awareness yeah. of that. So. Uh, that's that's a deep conversation, but one worthy of having, especially for some of our older SBC participants. Um, a, another question, um, Mr. Audrey asked again, um, from your perspective, when you're advising clients, is there, can you kind of go through the process of how they decide which plant implant is prudent for them to use? So there are about, uh, three major manufacturers for implants and each of those uh, companies uh, would produce uh, different levels of implant or different levels of strength or so a lot of the companies have an implant that's designed to be given to a calf at branding time and typically that implant is good for about 60 to 90 days depending on whose product that you choose and then after that, there are different levels of active ingredients in the different implants that are out there. And for the most part, the less active ingredient you get, the less performance you get out of it, but typically the better the cattle grade. The more ingredient you get, the more challenge you can have with um, bullers or riding in your pen or cattle that may not grade as well as you would like at the end, depending on what kind of genetic potential they had to grade. So a lot of those decisions are based on what the endpoint of the cattle is going to be. Most of the cattle and most of the customers they work with end up selling their cattle either on a cash, live cash basis or in a cash carcass basis. They're not at risk of any grade um, ramifications of what happened to the cattle. So for the most part, most of my clients, if they have the ability to manage the cattle on the highest dose implant, that's typically what they choose to do. If they have facilities that don't allow them to do that, they'll definitely pull the strength back of the implant so that they can get the cattle uh, to perform, but not cause problems while they're on feed. And a second portion of that question was actually directed at me, Dustin. So, um, and unfortunately I'm going to fail a little bit. Um, the other component of that question was what does uh, the yard that feeds these cattle typically use? Well, typically they use a 60 day version and typically would implant those cattle somewhere in, in mid February. Um, to be honest, Audrey, to your question, um, I can't tell you for certain what day those cattle uh, would have gotten implanted, but I will find that out and I will let this group know. Uh, we'll know pretty directly on that when we get our bills. If it doesn't, if it doesn't show on there, I will let you know. Um, but that's a, a, a great question. Um, and you can see how a 90 day for us could be pretty difficult. Um, mm -hmm. Dustin, you should know that in, in the, as we've been going through this project every year, these cattle are, are growing quite impressively. So it's difficult for us to really, uh, get into any of the extended implants because frankly these cattle are kicking it in the butt so that's good right, they just don't get that um, far down the road no um one more question i would have for you and then um i'm going to be quiet and if that if somebody else has a last minute question now's the time to get it in um oh looks oh. um my last question you mentioned how crucial it is to track data in today, it's always, but maybe more so now than ever in today's feedlot sector. Um, there are a lot of novel approaches and a lot of aggressive firms. Describe to me how you think maybe that the change in the level of data collection has changed in your career. And so you all know Dustin is not an old man by any stretch. And how you think it's going to change going forward over the next five to 10 years. And again, speculation clearly. Yep. So um, in the short time that I've been in the business, which has been about 16, 17 years, something like that, is the great 
of the lion's share of the of the cattle did not get tracked, and and the only tracking that most uh, of my clients had was when they went to the bank at the end of the year and they looked at their P and L, and they knew if their net worth grew or not. That's kind of how they tracked things, and it's a holist, you know, a whole farm deal, which, which I suppose is how we need to look at it for the most part, um, and it's evolved to <clears throat> where we had. DOS-based tracking systems where we hand entered data and and guys would write down how much feed they fed every day and we we you know put rations together for them and they'd follow them the best they could and and use scales and mixer wagons to to capture all that data um, to today where oh I guess maybe there's one more step in there we went from old technology on the computer to new technology and we got to a windows based system and with ultimately the same capturing of data with you know ration sheets and and relying on the feeder to write down what he fed correctly and, and then relay that to us and for me to sit down and put it in the computer and then sit down with him and ask him what he used for implants and what he had for cost and yardage and interest and feed prices and all the things that go into to creating you know what that steer uh, actually did for cost to gain to today where uh, we've got um, cloud-based tracking software that's driven off of iPads where um, the feed yard has access I have access I put rations together I can put them in the in the iPad or on the program for guys from wherever I'm at, whether I'm out for supper with my family or I'm sitting in my office or if I stop on the side of the road, I can get that data uploaded. Um, when those guys go to feed cattle, they select the ration, they select the pen, that the, the iPad captures every pound of feed that goes in their wagon, it captures every pound that comes out, it records it, it puts it in all kinds of different spreadsheets and graphs and you can evaluate that thing 10 ways to sunday if you want and it uh we're pretty much in the infancy stage of this at this point but it's uh created an awareness that some feeders are okay with and some are pretty embarrassed of and it's 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 a wide reaction of or a wide array of reactions depending on how it's going for them and what they're getting done so you know how how i see it in the future you know um, the tracking system that we're currently using is talking about going to a shoot side eid with high frequency and low frequency tags so that every steer is weighed and dosed correctly for um, insecticides and drugs and all the uh, drugs that they're given are recorded and withdrawals are kept you know up to speed so they know that if steer 17 got treated and he can't leave for 42 days and they know that um that i would say is probably going to be here by 2020 or or so or 2021 for sure um past that i think that uh with the uh, autonomous tractors and stuff that are getting tested and in, in today's environment that there could likely be a time probably not that far down the road in my opinion, which could be 10 years or maybe 15, we could have uh, autonomous feed trucks or tractor wagons or whatever uh, configuration makes the most sense for feed yards. Um, labor is a huge issue. So I know that there would be uh, clients that I work with that are big enough that would say, hey, if I don't have to deal with somebody coming and punching a clock today and I can program that feed truck to come in and load feed off the pile and go deliver it to the cattle and and the computer can track it all around the farm that's more reliable than than making sure that my employees show up on time every day and at the same time every day it's uh, less critical if it's maybe raining out or maybe the wind's blowing that autonomous tractor maybe doesn't care as much as maybe what you and i might it's I guess from my standpoint, I think some of the things you just talked about just reminds all of us on this call, especially the young folks who are kind of on the front side of thinking about what careers might look like. It shows there's loads of opportunities. There's going to be a lot of folks out there 
needing to uh, develop some of these systems, fine tune, serve as a, more of a consulting role uh, as you do. And so um, exciting stuff. Well, yeah, we yeah, certainly. Yeah, absolutely. And so and to me, that's exciting because way too often we uh, uh, leave folks with the impression, young folks and with the impression that there aren't opportunities in this business. And I'd say there's almost certainly more now than there's ever been. Um, Jackie, I'm going to be quiet. I've quizzed Dustin a lot with some of these kids' questions. And um, I'm going to let Jackie see if she has anything real quick. Yeah, and um, boy, thank you, Dustin. I really, really enjoyed that and um, really enjoyed the, the interaction here. Um, I, I guess one question um, uh, that I've been thinking about in particular with this audience and, and the, the, along the vein of what we were just discussing is do you have any advice for somebody who's, um, you know, young and and getting into this industry and has an interest in in staying within the industry uh, for their career. Do you have any advice as far as um, you know, just kind of uh, life life things that would would help them be successful in the future? I, I will try. So so maybe <laughs> one of the things that I will share from my own experience is that. I wanted to be in production and agriculture with every thread of my being. And um, if you look at the operation that I came from, it absolutely was not in the cards for me to go back home and be a full-time farmer. And that um, was a huge challenge in my life, but thankfully I was able to overcome that. And I think with, with that in mind, I would encourage folks that, you know, production and agriculture is great, if it makes sense in your in your path and your family but if not don't be discouraged there are thousands of opportunities out there to be part of animal agriculture in particular if not feed grain agriculture to help feed people uh, there are less and less people that want to do this every day um, it takes folks that have a passion for it and that care to, to stay at it. Uh, my advice is to find a uh, land grant university close to you that focuses on agriculture. And um, I have my own opinions about maybe who has some of the better programs right now. And I would share that um, off of here probably. Um, but there are lots of great programs at different universities across the United States that, that want to help uh, get folks into agriculture. Um, I, I think that uh, we've even got a local, um, a smaller uh, private college that has invested a lot of money into, an, into a two year ag program that I think can help get, get folks out into the industry and, and working with uh, the things that they love even though they might not own them. And uh, what I figured out is that being able to come home after 40 hours and work on the cows at my house or the motorcycles in my garage and and stuff is very rewarding, even though I'm not the guy that's here every day, every day, every day. So uh, don't be discouraged. Keep your head up. I mean, whether you like the data entry or the, the data crunching, you know, like uh, happens with Chip and some of the stuff that he does, or if you want to help people make uh, better genetic decisions, there are those opportunities out there. Um, I, I get calls all the time for people that are looking for cowboys to help gab out cows, or feedlots that are looking for feed truck drivers, um, or pen riders. Those those opportunities are are out there immense right now. We just can't. Um, I thought I seen something that said in the next 10 years that agriculture is going to be 22,000 people short of filling all the positions that it would like to. So I think if you want to go into agriculture, it's a golden age right now. That's great. Thank you, Dustin. With that, well, I, I'm, I'm good. Yeah, I think we're good other than 
I say thank you to everybody. Dustin, huge thank you. And I learned a little something. I'll, I'll have to ask about the motorcycles later. That'll be an off the air conversation as well. <laughs> um, so there you go. That's uh, we'll we'll leave that for another time. But thank you so much, Dustin, for taking your evening. Uh, thank you to the young folks um, for for chiming in and joining in this evening and your good questions. Remember, um, as uh, Dr. Jackie said early on, you have a write up from this due a week away. And so make sure you put some effort into that. If you have questions on that, those kind of things, of course, you can always reach out. Again, your weights and intakes are in the data uh, sheet. Your billing information should be available within mere days. And so we'll get those out to you soon. And with that, unless there's a last minute thing from anybody, I say, Dustin, thank you. I say, Jackie, thank you. Young people, thank you. And to all, have a great Fat Tuesday. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Good night.